fashion industry can be like really opaque and like really hard to access. And I think the way that we change that is being true and honest and authentic to who we are. And none of us only care about fashion, only speak in terms of clothes and images and models and trends. Like we all contain multitudes. And so leaning into my personality has been something that's been hugely beneficial for me. And, and it is a responsibility. Like I think when people hear me say something or do something, they know that I mean it and that I stand behind it. I was very, very in love with my grandmother, my mother, my aunt, women in my family who just had this like extraordinary sense of style. And I looked up to them for so many reasons, but I think the earliest thing that I could engage with was their aesthetic eye and the way they put clothes together. And I loved looking at family photos. And one summer, I think I might've been like, six or seven, I was in Connecticut at my Aunt Rosalie's house and I found out, just like happenstance, that she used to be a fashion model. And I saw these amazing portraits of her as this like beautiful West African, dark-skinned woman walking the runways of Paris and being photographed by legendary photographers for Isimiyake campaigns. And it just became a fascination and an obsession of mine. The fashion industry was modeled to me in a way that I think a lot of generations weren't exposed to and I started to know the more industrial elements of the industry and I think I became very obsessed with becoming a fashion editor probably because of like Lisa Love and Grace Coddington and Tawny Goodman and like the September issue and the Devil Wears Prada, you know, all of that media. I definitely had that pressure to go to a traditional college or a liberal arts school. But I also was a really rebellious kid and I was like, well, who cares if my family is this way? Like I want to work in fashion and I'm gonna get to the top and the only way to do it is to immerse myself in it. So I really wanted to go to Parsons. Like that was my dream. It ended up being far too expensive for us to afford. And then additionally, my mom was kind of like, look, you have your time to pursue all of your passions. Like, why don't you just get a baseline, a baseline of knowledge across the creative field and that's something you can do at a liberal arts school. So when Barnard accepted me, I was like, I'm gonna go to that school. A, because it's an all women's school and that's fab and I don't wanna share a dorm room with gross boys. B, it's in New York City so I can kind of like go to class, AKA like intern and work in fashion <laughs> my whole life. So that's what I did. I, I went to Barnard and to be honest, this industry is one in which nepotism is really rampant and I didn't have an in to the fashion industry. I like had to create my own way in. So I think being at Barnard gave me kind of like a competitive edge, you know. Unfortunately, I think it's shocking to some people that I went to a liberal arts college and that I succeeded there in a traditional sense. It kind of bypasses all of the legs up that I didn't have, you know. I didn't have the the dad who played golf was so and so, and I didn't have the Hermes handbag that like spoke more than I did and when I was walking into my interview, I didn't have any of that. So I had to really kill people with intellect and kind of surprise them with uh, my formal education. Practically speaking, I think interning is invaluable. I happen to be that old school, like it's gonna sound like back in my day we had to climb 20 flights of stairs to get to Condé Nast, which we did. But it's not even about kind of being a traditionalist and saying that you need to like work for everything that you have and go and no task is too small and go through the motions. It's really just like dating your field, <laughs> like dating your industry, which I think is super, super valuable. I tried to do as many internships as I could to figure out where I belonged. I think the fashion industry is like weirdly not transparent. Like it's really vague to an outsider. It's like very hard to understand the machinations of the industry without witnessing them. And I think, yeah, you could do that in an entry level position that you eventually leave and then move industries. But like, why not get your taste of as much as you can to be able to make a really informed decision about where you want to focus your energies. That being said, it was so annoying to me that I had to spend sensibly five years, like one year before college and then through the entirety of college, working 
for minimum wage when it was paid and zero wage when it was unpaid. That was really, really difficult. I ended up having to apply for scholarships. I actually did the Fashion Scholarship Fund, which is a great program. And I ended up winning like a semi-finalist prize and getting the $5,000 that supported me for my summer internship as a junior. Cause it was getting to the point where it was like, I need to make money. So yeah, I resented a lot the idea that in order to get comfortable or introduced to a field that I was obsessed with, I had to honestly like impoverish myself. But I also think that what I got was worth it in the end. It's like, I mean, you gotta leap for what you want. You know, you might be at the edge of the cliff and like thinking it's not a good idea to go off, but you're not gonna know until you jump. It started to make sense to me that I went to college and studied art history because those were the references that were coming out in the tiniest pull quote about a Victorian manner that Hamish was writing about in Vogue magazine. And the most useful and valuable tool that I learned from him was the art of research. You were writing research essays on the creative field, essentially working for him. So that was powerful and also useful to me, even if, as I transitioned out of features. Like it's something that is now at the heart of the styling that I do. It's like research, 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 learn, learn, learn. And I got this voracious appetite from him. I mean, I think what's so funny about styling is oftentimes you can tell who a stylist has worked for by their work. And I think the immediate shorthand and, and visual language can be something that's like really helpful in the relationship between a stylist and their assistant and can go on to perpetuate like a certain, you know, aesthetic eye and like a certain visual language. But what was so interesting for me and Tani is like outside of how we interpret fashion, we're also just like polar opposite people. Like she grew up on, I think the Upper West Side in uh, New York City and you know, was like a brearly girl and then had like her like hippie renaissance. And I was from Southern California and was like, I'm gonna dive into the deep end of New York, had no idea what I was doing, but I'm gonna grind until I make it. We really had polar opposite experiences and I, but I think what we shared is that neither of them were typical of the fashion industry. Being this outsider that just had this charisma and this way with people and this way of soaking up the world around her that made her someone that was interesting to fashion. And I think I translate those same ideas in my own way. It's like I can get along with almost anyone. The ways in which I'm different make me interesting. And so it didn't really matter that Tani and I weren't similar because we were learning, the, we learned the same lessons and I could learn those lessons from her because she had experienced them. If I had to use three words to describe the way Tani styles, it's like classic, elegant, and like effortless and minimalist kind of, that's, that's the world that Tani has created. It's like you're learning the textbook and the rules so that you can bend them or distort them or break them or reinvent them. And so the ways in which I am chaotic in my style actually are derived from super traditional values in, in the styling world. It sounds so basic, but it's something that I didn't think about or take to heart for basically my entire youth, which is everything happens for a reason. At the same time as I saw other assistants, you know, crying in the corner because the Chanel dress was on the flight still from Paris and it wasn't gonna get to FedEx in time and you know their boss wasn't gonna have it for the cover shot. I was with a mentor who was like, you know what? If it's not here, it's not meant to be. Everything happens for a reason. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna pivot and we're gonna be malleable with our ideas and our creativity is actually gonna engineer the way forward, not the plan that we made two and a half weeks ago. And that's kind of what happened with me leaving Tawny. It was like, I got an offer. I was petrified because I had been an assistant for about four and a half years and like under five years. At the time, you were assisting for seven years, eight years before you, you know, were even like allowed to be pursuing other ideas. Um, so it felt like it was kind of premature. I didn't, I had the imposter syndrome that we all have just thinking like, can I actually do this on my own? Can I trade on my own name, my own eye, my own aesthetic? Is that appealing or valuable to the editorial landscape. And it happened to be a very young magazine that was trying to create a space in the American market called Garage Magazine. 
now defunct, <laughs> but um, it was the exact space I needed to really define who I was as a stylist. And Tani was like, let go and let God. She was like, everything happens for a reason. I don't think, and you know what was so interesting actually? She's such a gracious person. I think she had heard from someone that I had gone on this interview or like it had been like kind of brewing and I hadn't told her because I loved her and I was scared and I was sad and I was like on a shoot with her. It was an American Vogue shoot in Vegas and we were having our like requisite, you know, pre-shoot margarita and she was like, you know, I think it's time for you to move on and I was like, Oh my God, thank God you just said that I got this job offer, I'm gonna take it. And in my naive brain, I thought that like the stars had aligned, but she was really like setting up a comfortable environment for me to tell her that I was moving on and she was just so supportive and it was, it was one of those everything happens for a reason moments. It's not how it goes for most people. When I joined Garage, it really did feel like kismet because I had had a bit of a struggle, I guess, transitioning into the straight, strictly fashion industry, coming from my art history background. There were also moments in college where I was like, maybe I wanna pursue this more seriously. Like maybe I could be a gallerist who also represents fashion clients. Like I was trying to find a way of bridging these two worlds that are inherently already very connected. And it seemed like the perfect publication just like fell into my lap. And I ended up being hired by a woman, Thessaly LaForce, who previously was a features editor and writer at Vogue.com and Vogue. So we had a whole history and a relationship prior and it just made sense. I felt very comfortable going into the role. Once I was there, once I became a fashion editor, I kind of felt a sense of duty and responsibility around the images that I was going to create. You know, Garage as a fine art and high fashion publication typically dealt with top models who at the time were predominantly thin, predominantly white. And it felt like if I was gonna be a stakeholder and if I was gonna be a decision maker in this publication, that part of my decisions had to reflect the fact that I wanted to see a change in this industry. So any chance I could get, I was full force running towards working with black collaborators, black image makers, black models, telling black stories because I felt like they were absent not only from fashion, but contemporary art. And so creating a platform that could platform both black artists and black talent and black stories was perfect. And like, it was really a profound honor and also sense of responsibility of me to like lean into those stories. So Black Cotillion that I photographed with Nadine Ijwari, who's a brilliant Nigerian English photographer. She, she and I were kind of like, it's so weird because we're, we're, we're kind of like retro in our sensibility. Like I think we are referential. She loves research, like I love research. And we are looking at this era that stylistically we are attracted to. We love the hair, we love the clothes, but we weren't seeing the black representation. It was like, why aren't the references diverse? Like why are we looking at slim errands and like all blonde white people in Palm Springs in this hyper affluent environment for style tips when really that exact language was also adopted by and also probably formulated by our ancestors and we have that in our family albums and we have that in our oral histories and visual histories like we need to create the reference so that 20 years from now we can be the, the pictures that artists are referencing to update and recreate and expand upon um, so that was like the project it was like let's create the references and that was something that I felt we could do at Garage and, and something that we leaned into. I think that I feel incredibly blessed and fortunate to be able to dictate the artists that I work with. I think that some of the reasons why I work for these publications is because of the relationships that I have and the kind of roster of talent that I can bring in to these establishments. That being said, like fashion is not always a meritocracy. And there does seem to be at times a formula or a ratio or a certain algebra that has to do with the curation of, of talent. Um, you know, how many times can you have young, cool, new blood shooting if you don't also have the 
most established, the most, you know, long tenured photographers working and, it, and I'm finding that balance can be difficult because for me, I, I think it is our duty as fashion editors to like actively create the next generation of image making and the next generation of storytelling. And it can be hard to do when you're not also working with the older generation or the biggest stakeholders because for some reason it, all, it can reflect as like, you're not at that level. And so you have to kind of be delicate about where you're pushing, when you're pushing, how much you're pushing. I wanna bring everyone with me. And I also am reaching to grab hands with people who aren't with me that I also admire and that have, are, do, are on similar missions and cultivating similar communities. And, you know, the idea of having a fashion landscape that is more representative of the world that I see, which is an incredibly diverse world, viewpoint wise, visually, you know, taste wise, that's the fashion industry we should all be working towards. So if I have to kind of like forsake the establishment in order to do that, I'm gonna do it. It's so interesting that you asked that because I happen to be a part of a generation of stylists, I think, that were pushing right up against the editor being the ultimate influencer and the influencer being the ultimate influencer. And there was a lot of resistance to the idea of influencers. It was like, oh, just because you have a point of view and you have taste means that you can come out and proselytize to your millions of audience members and be at the same and seated right next to me as a fashion editor? I don't think so. Meanwhile, I was like, wait, we're the same. Like we're not, you know, not in terms of, you know, going through the industry, moving through the industry in the same way, but the idea that you are a fashion editor, for me, it's like our job is to go to these little planets that these alien designers have created every season and then take our research notes and collect our samples and then go back to our home planet and disseminate this information and interpret it in a way that is like easier to metabolize for our various audiences. It's exactly the same thing that people do on social media as influencers. And it became clear to me that I was a fashion editor that was also marketing to an extent who I am, my ideas, my value system. And it was because I was willing to share that part of myself with, with my audience. As fashion editors, when we're styling like big center of book spreads, it's like we're looking at the worlds that these designers created and then infusing ourselves and giving of our own vision and our own ideas to craft a story. And what's so interesting about doing it on a design level, or at least not just interesting, but it's compelling for me, is that we're in an industry right now where that's in flux, you know, that's changing. And so many of the things that I care most about in my pictures, diversity of representation, you know, um, honoring of all body types, those are things that I can now impact on a ground level. Like the reason why we can't shoot curve models all the time is because curved samples don't exist. But if I can create clothes in which those samples exist, then that's six months later, an image that exists out in the world that then becomes product that's available in stores. And I think the design level is probably the most micro, it's probably the closest you can get to like inception. <laughs> So if you're starting there, the whole landscape opened up. And I just, I wanna do so much more of it. I'm also like, look, this is the girl who tried to go to Parsons and mom was like, no, you need to get a liberal arts degree. Like I also have a secret designer fantasy. So I get to cosplay anytime I go into a collaboration and live my Tim Gunn fantasy. I think fashion in general is democratizing more so because the audience doesn't need us to tell them what to like anymore. Like I think that people, I think that the access to information and the access to um, building one's own knowledge and one's own eye and one's own taste is like so much more accessible now that, you know, uh, the expert opinion is certainly valuable but isn't the only resource for fashion and style. So I think in general, we're gonna be more of a reflection of society instead of dictating society, at least visually speaking. Um, but on my best day, I am so excited because I have the best samples and as close to a curved size as possible and I can make 
images that are as good with these incredible models as they would be, you know, that, that are curved as they would be if I was working with a size zero or sample size model. That's on my best day. On my worst day, I'm annoyed and frustrated that I have to problem solve or freak it or like open the seam and cut this jean and use like every weapon in my creative arsenal to execute a fashion image for a non-sample size person. And I'm doubly frustrated that I seem to be one of very few editors interested in doing it. And, and on my worst, 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 worst day, I resent the fact that the big woman is the person who is tasked with solving the issue with everyone else's issue about big women. So it, it, it's, it's certainly a sliding scale and an emotional journey, um, reconciling that this industry is moving and is changing and is going in the right direction, but is going slowly and is also predominantly only going because of people who can directly relate to the issues at hand and are directly invested in expanding representation. It should be a goal for all of us and it isn't yet. Um, so in my, in my ultimate perfect fantasy, it becomes a goal, an ambition, you know, an aim of the most powerful stakeholders in this industry. Growing up with traditional American Vogue, it was like, these are the Vogue girls. And it's like, those were, I mean, I was obsessed with Caroline Trentini, like she was literally, she invented jumping. Like what she did for image making is something that like completely motivated me wanting to become a stylist and me wanting to work at Vogue. And now there's like 4,000 Trentinis that we're like actually able to work with because it like, we're expanding the silo of Vogue level talent or, you know, fashion industry accepted models and an amazing example of that is there is this amazing musician she's french i saw her for the first time at the mcqueen show i think it was spring summer 23. her name is isot and she is like i'm not gonna say she's like otherworldly because like she's gorgeous and she's like every other woman on this world but she's otherworldly in that she's better than us like she's just like perfect she is gorgeous she has this incredible body this incredible confidence she was like stomping down this runway in a as somebody who was also a fat woman, like it was so powerful for me to know that she was in lineup with size zero girls for six hours. She was like getting her makeup done by like maybe not a person of color. She was, you know, and she still, you know, exited that onto that runway and tore it down. She's a muse, like she's a hundred percent a muse. And then I also became very obsessed with a new model named Angelina Kendall, who's very young. And she, I just, we had our, her, one of her first castings in New York for New York Fashion Week last season. And she, it was one of those moments where she came in and everyone was like, are we seeing something? Like, are we witnessing something? Like, is something happening? Is this a turning point? Like it's, we're so nostalgic. And I think we're like so performative in my era and um, generation of fashion. And we're like, we want our like Linda Evangelista meeting my Zell moment. Like we want those moments that we know are gonna change fashion. And that really felt like, a moment. We were like, we're seeing a star in the making. I think what we need to be better at and what we're getting better at, and I think what the industry will soon reflect is like, we need to become curators of experience, not just clothing. Like I think the stories that we tell need to be stories that more folks can engage with and that reflect more experiences. And I think that the subjects that we choose need to also reflect the land, the diverse landscape of body types, of uh, backgrounds. I think, I think for a long time as, you know, a reader of magazines and someone who grew up on fashion media, I was bombarded with images that didn't look like me and would never be me, could never be me, like, and told that that was what you should aspire to. So in this changing landscape and with these new ideas, we also need to be creating a world that we aspire to, but a world that is more equitable. I think the new global system at Condé Nast in general is so reflective of the way that the world works now. Like we are in a moment of mass globalization in terms of media and kind of collapsing the dialogue into like this singular Vogue voice is really interesting and compelling to me as an editor. It's also a huge challenge. And how do we, 
adapt stories that are like regional specific or community specific and make that something that is appealing and interesting to everyone else in the world rather than just, you know, the country we're in or the city we're in or the people we're highlighting. It's really created the challenge of expanding our taste and our vocabulary to be something that's like malleable to different communities, which ultimately has been all I've ever wanted because it means that inherently there's diversity in the stories. I find that to be where the whole industry should be going. I find that to be prudent because it's where the whole industry should be going and it's also very, you know, it's fun to travel the world.